thanks everyone for being here. We're going to go ahead and get started since we have a lot of presentations today. Um, just FYI, the event number for to call for CME is actually 241052, not 240 for anyone that needs that. All right. Um, our first presenter is a fourth year medical student from Nova Southeastern University, Mom Jara Guy. Um, her fun fact is that in high school, she actually presented the news in French on national television. Very cool. And she's going to be uh, giving us a presentation titled Bridging Quantitative and Qualitative Insights, a Mixed Methods Inquiry into the Gambia National Eye Care Program among Students. Good morning, my name is Mamjara, and today I'll be presenting on my inquiry into the school eye health program in the Gambia. So just to provide an overview, the Gambia is like the smallest country in West Africa, on, actually on mainland Africa. Um, it has a population of about 2.7 million and 49% of the population is actually aged between zero to 17 years of age. So currently the Gambia has like seven vision centers and as you can see, the one with the yellow dot is where the is the only one in an urban area, and it is actually the only location with like a specialty clinic. It is also the main site for all like eye emergencies in the country. And just to show you what the current workforce for the Gambia looks like. So in addition to the seven eye centers, there's also the Nas national hospital called EFSTH. And as you can see, there's like five ophthalmologists in the entire country. Um, they're called consultant ophthalmologists just because some of them are there on post-sense and are just there for a certain period of time. So it's not necessarily five like throughout the year. And it's like one per 540,000 individuals in the country. So... What is the National Eye Health Program? In like 1986, the Ministry of Health and Sight Savers, they decided to initiate this program with a mission to like reduce blindness in alignment with like the Vision 2020 goals. So like since that time, like they've been able to like successfully like do national surveys, but like all of the surveys have been done in adults, mainly aged 35 and older. So they then decided to develop a school health programs where they do screenings and like students among the country. And they partnered with one side, which is a nonprofit in the country. The Ministry of Secondary Education, as well as the University of Vermont, has been like supporting the school eye health program. So what I wanted to do is this program has been running for a while. I wanted to do an inquiry to see how they've been running, as well as interview like the staff from the ministry and the eye health program to kind of understand the challenges they've been having, like in terms of like follow up and just managing this program. So I was like given data from the Ministry of Education for the screening that they did between 2022 and 2023. And I compared it between public and private schools. So there's a lot going on, but there wasn't necessarily a lot of data that they've been collecting. So mainly it was um, gender, the class levels, as well as um, the impairment that the students had. So what I saw was like between levels one to four, which would be kindergarten here, um, there was actually a higher level of vision impairment in private school um, versus public school. And we saw a higher rate actually in boys. And we see that at level four, there's actually zero at the public school institution, which raises the concern that like, generally people at public schools tend to come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. So we're seeing a lower number for public schools, not necessarily because there isn't any, but they're just not getting enrolled in school. Then when we go through grade one to nine, we still see that it is higher in boys um, from grades one to six. And here we start to see that there's actually a higher level of vision impairment at the public school level. Then from grade seven to nine, we start to see that it's actually higher in girls. So what makes it interesting is generally speaking, um, vision impairment, it's women and girls that are mostly affected, but our data doesn't necessarily reflect that. We also know that data has support, supported that um, women with disabilities are less likely to get enrolled in schools, particularly in developing countries like the Gambia. So I kind of discussed this, like there's a gender disparity element that we're kind of seeing from the data that we're collecting, as well as the low numbers that we're seeing in the public school level. So I asked the Ministry of Health and like, um, 
as well as the National Eye Health Program. So you've been going to the schools, you've been asking them, you've been collecting all these individuals with vision impairment. What do you do next? So there isn't a formal follow-up protocol and like kind of what I gathered from like the interview using like a semi-structured one was they've been having challenges with follow-up or like the students report like limitations with like transportation to the eye care facilities. Just to show you the one that's like at Basse to where the only specialty clinic is, it's like a six hour drive and that's the only way to get there. Um, they also reported experience in budget cuts from the government and as well as having to pay out of pocket sometimes for patients to get like transportation. Um, so overall, like it was mainly them reporting a limited support system. So like there are a few limitations with the current screening guidelines. Um, everything is lumped on the vision impairment. So there's no way to actually differentiate like what the refractive errors are or like who needs surgery. Um, they've just been doing the screenings and like categorizing um, everyone as like vision impairment. So there's no current framework that specifies the diagnosis. There's a lack of a follow-up protocol, which I think is a bit problematic because it is important to find the problem, but it is important to find solutions to address some of these. Um, there's also a limited screening scope. Um, Gambia, the literacy rate is about 60%. So when we do a national eye health program where it is among students, we're leaving out a good chunk of the individuals who are not actually enrolled in school or non-formal schools. So this is more so of a personal quality improvement project where I am actually working with like the Ministry of Education as well as the eye health program to like optimize the screening program. So what we're doing right now is um, how do we optimize the data collection? There is no demographic data that is being collected. So it is important to know the locations of the school as well as the age of the individuals, as well as like defining what does vision impairment means. It's, it's very different to say someone has refraction, like a refractive error versus blindness. So it is important that we're able to actually distinguish that from the data that is being co collected. Um, but it is also important to establish a follow-up protocol. So we're actually working to kind of set up a referral system as well as a pathway to, for people to actually um, get to the right places. And for my role, it is actually to continue scheduling the regular meetings. Because I did the interviews where I interviewed the staff and um, the ministry, I never actually was able to like interview the students. So I'll be going to Gambia in December and January to be able to actually interview the students and ask them, what are the challenges you're having? Because the only way to like provide tailored intervention is hearing directly from the people we're actually collecting the data from. All right. So here's like a Gantt chart of like what the plan is for the eye health program. So over the next few months, like I'll be working with them where hopefully by the end of October, we'll be able to like have revised the survey. And we're hoping by the end of the year, we would have like developed a follow up protocol in order to actually like improve the current system that is in place. And I mean, down the line over the next year, hopefully we can like actually do better data analysis and reporting since there's so much like limited data that we have right now. So the main takeaway from this project is that it is important to have like public health interventions, but it is actually very important to like monitor and evaluate them. Having quality metrics that we can measure makes a huge difference because this program has been running for a while, but there isn't actually any measure that we can show to see how effective it's been over the past few years. Um, as well as like public health interventions are important, but like there isn't a one size fits all. Um, something that can work here doesn't necessarily work for the um, context of Gambia, and it is always important to remember that. And lastly, um, the goal is really to promote like the eye health program to move towards like a more data driven approach where they can like actually use measures to show that, hey, this is why we need funding. This is the impact of our work. And um, I don't think they've been able to do that. So I want to acknowledge a few people um, who have helped me with this project. So first I'll thank like Dr. Charles Bouchard, who I met last year at the Global Ophthalmology Summit. And it was from our conversation that he thought I needed to meet Laurie. And it was from our conversation about the work Moran has been doing for the Navajo Nation and providing glasses for students um, at school and at home is really what prompted me to actually look into what the Gambia was doing for their eye health care program. Dr. Fall is who started the eye health care program in the Gambia. She has been my mentor and is probably the only reason the ministry is like responding to my emails. And Dr. Haidara, who's like the director of the Sheikh Zayed 
um, Eye Center, who's also working with me on this project. Ms. Kanye, who's a program manager of the Eye Health Care program, is also working with me. And Don Owens, who is my research mentor. Thank you. And I will welcome questions and feedback. Okay, we can have Alina Hussein come up next. We'll pull up your presentation too. Um, Alina is coming to us from Cornell. Um, and uh, fun fact about her, she is very into knitting. So she's actually knitted seven sweaters and two vests so far. So if you need some winter clothes, she's the person to talk to. Um, and she's going to be giving a talk, Leveraging Artificial Intelligence for Learner Assessment, a Surgical Curriculum for Ophthalmology Residents Project. We'll just pull up your presentation here. If I can. Right here. Okay. Thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Polsky. Before I begin this presentation, I just wanna extend a big thank you to everyone in this room and not in this room for an absolutely wonderful rotation. I want to especially thank all the residents, fellows, faculty, and staff for being so kind and welcoming to a newcomer to Utah like me, and also to everyone for making such an effort to teach me throughout this month. I am very grateful. I also want to give a shout out to Dr. Wirtz for telling me to go to Albion Basin, as well as Donut Falls, and also a shout out to Uzra, my lovely co-rotator, for going with me to Albion Basin so that I had company. And before I delve into this project, I just want to provide a little bit of background. The Association of University Professors of Ophthalmology created the Surgical Curriculum for Ophthalmology Residents, also known as SCORE, to provide standardized surgical training and assessment to ophthalmology residents. This curriculum was created because there are no clearly defined surgical competency standards for ophthalmology residents, nor are there any standardized surgical education resources for ophthalmology residents to use. The first SCORE curriculum that was created is the Advanced Cataract and Interior Segment Sealed Curriculum, which is shown on the left-hand side of this screen. And this aims to provide residents with standardized surgical training and assessment in interior segment skills, and it's aimed at the PGY4 level. This curriculum contains an online component, which is shown on the right-hand side of the screen, and that contains educational modules on the physiology, pathophysiology, and surgical techniques involved in the anterior segment. Residents who participate in this curriculum are required to complete each of these educational modules prior to participating in an in-person wet lab, where they can not only demonstrate their surgical competency, but also receive one-on-one -on -one instruction from a faculty member with greater than five years of experience in teaching interior segment skills. So far, this curriculum has been held five times from 2021 to 2023, and 420 residents have participated. The purpose of my project was to develop multiple choice assessments for the educational modules in this curriculum using generative artificial intelligence. And I've shown you what a few of these modules look like on the right-hand side of the screen. Specifically, these assessments tested topics like nuclear disassembly, IOL exchange, iridodialysis, MIGS, manual small incision cataract surgery, as well as the management of small pupils, zonulopathy, and posterior capsular rupture. In order to produce these assessments, the SCORE Assessment Question Writing Group, comprised of 16 ophthalmologists across the United States, as well as two medical students, one of which was myself, was created. Ophthalmologists served as content experts who identified high-yield subject matter from each of these educational modules, while me and the other medical student produced questions for assessment based on this high-yield subject matter using generative artificial intelligence. My primary role in the project was to figure out exactly how we could leverage artificial intelligence in order to produce these assessments. And after countless hours and significant trial and error, I figured out that we could use ChatGPT Plus versions 4 and 4 Turbo to create these assessments. Specifically, I created custom generative pre-trained transformers, or GPTs, a blank version of which is shown on the right-hand side of the screen, for each of these educational modules. Basically, each of these GPTs provided a set of instruction for ChatGPT in order to produce an assessment on a given module. 
After we'd have produced these assessments, they were edited and refined by content experts, and then a random number generator was used to randomize these answer choices. Now, as everyone in this room, or almost everyone, is a current or future educator, I think it's important to understand how we can use artificial intelligence to enhance our teaching. And for this reason, I'm really gonna delve into the methods of how I did this project so that you can understand how you can use an accessible AI technology like ChatGPT to produce assessments for your learners. So when asking AI to complete a task for you, it's important to first provide it with context, like the sign that tells someone that they're entering Utah. You then wanna provide the AI with key information it needs to know to complete the task, as well as an example of the output you would like, which in this case would be samples of good multiple choice questions. Finally, you wanna provide it with a detailed set of instructions it needs to complete in order to achieve the task and also the formatted output you would like. And I'm gonna show you exactly what this looked like for my project. So first I provided ChatGPT with some context. I said, you are writing multiple choice questions to test an ophthalmology resident's knowledge of advanced cataract and interior segment skills. Use the following characteristics to generate or qualify these multiple choice questions for an exam that will test an ophthalmology resident's knowledge. And I'm gonna show you exactly what these characteristics look like on the next slide. Then it's important to provide key information, which in this case are the characteristics of good multiple choice questions and good answer choices. These images are pulled directly from the AAO item writing guide, which basically characterizes what should go into a good question and subsequently good answer choices. And I'd like to highlight some of these characteristics. One of the important characteristics of a good question is that it should be answerable even with the options covered. So as you're reading the question, you already have the idea of what the answer is, is in your head, and then you can select it from the multiple choice options available. In terms of good answer choices, I think one of the most important characteristics is that the answer choices should be attractive to at least some candidates. This means that as you read the options, if you're not as familiar with the concept, you at least think some of the options could be possible. If there's some answer choices you immediately discount, that doesn't make for a very good multiple choice question because you don't have to think as hard to get to the answer. Then I provided ChatGPT with specific examples of good multiple choice questions. This is a sample question that I pulled from a question writing task force PowerPoint from the AAO, and it focuses on the mechanism of angle closure glaucoma that can be treated with an iridotomy. Notably, I provided sample questions from multiple different sources in order for ChatGPT to train on what several good questions might look like. And I also indicated what the correct answer was as well. And finally, I gave ChatGPT a very detailed set of instructions it needed in order to complete this task. When the content experts looked at the educational modules, they gave me a list of bullets of the high yield concepts. So the first thing I did was ask ChatGPT to repeat the bullet of the high yield concept that I'd entered. This was important because if a question that was generated wasn't very good quality, I could at least see what concept it was trying to test. After this, I asked ChatGPT to elaborate on the concept, meaning that it needed to really conceptualize the bullet and also derive additional testable material from a transcript of the educational module that it uploaded as a text file to the GPT. Next, I wanted it to reason about potential mistakes a resident might make when thinking about this concept because that would form the basis of a good multiple choice question. After this, I wanted ChatGPT to think about what a good question testing this concept would look like, and also to remind itself of those characteristics of good multiple choice questions and answers, which I told to it earlier. And finally, I wanted it to select a definite concept to test in its question. After that, it provided me with a question and six multiple choice options. And I'm gonna show you exactly what this looked like for our module on intraoperative IOL exchange management. So in this case, the high yield concept that the content expert had identified was that silicone IOLs are very slippery when they're coated with viscoelastic, which makes grabbing and folding the IOL difficult. When elaborating on this concept, ChatGPT wrote that silicone IOLs present unique challenges during removal due to their material. Specifically, when they're coated with viscoelastic, the lenses become extremely slippery, which can complicate the process of grabbing and folding the IOL. This slipperiness can make the removal process more difficult, and it also can increase the risk of complications. Then it reasoned about what potential mistakes a resident might make when thinking about this concept. They might underestimate the difficulties associated with the removal of silicon IOLs. 
They could also attempt their standard removal techniques without accounting for the slipperiness, which could lead to an increased risk of losing control of the IOL and potentially cause damage to intraocular structures. ChatGPT then reasoned about what a good question testing this concept would look like. A good question should test the resident's understanding of the specific risks and challenges involved in removing silicon IOLs, particularly the difficulty in handling them when they're coated with viscoelastic. And finally, we have our definite concept, which by this time you've heard before, which is that these IOLs are difficult to remove because of their slippery nature when they're coated with viscoelastic. And now we have our sample question. What makes the removal of silicon IOLs challenging? A, their slippery nature when coated with viscoelastic makes grabbing and folding difficult. B, they're more prone to tearing during removal. C, they require specialized cutting tools for removal. D, they have a higher risk of causing zonular damage. E, they're more likely to adhere to ocular tissues. And F, they're more difficult to visualize during removal. Obviously, there are some issues with this question, and we had it subsequently edited by our content expert. Our content expert decided that choice A needed some edits, namely we needed to remove the making grabbing and folding part difficult, and they also made it more in parallel with the other answer choices. They also removed answer choices C and D as those were less plausible compared to some of the other answer choices in the question. And now we have our final question. What makes the removal of silicon IOLs challenging? And we have option choices A through D. Notably, we also provided explanations for the correct answer choices in these assessments, um, and ChatGBT provided these explanations, which were subsequently edited. We also provided explanations for the incorrect answer choices as well, so that residents could understand why the wrong answers were wrong. Using this method, we ultimately produced 523 questions that we selected for review by content experts, of which 266 were ultimately included. While going through this process, I found that ChatGBT was primarily limited in its ability to produce plausible incorrect answer choices. I think this is because I only fed in a specific amount of ophthalmology information into ChatGPT and didn't train it on swaths of ophthalmology text. This made it a little hard for ChatGPT to understand the relationship between different anatomical structures in the eye or what are realistic complications if someone were to perform an incorrect step during surgery. Also, as ChatGPT is a large language model that produces words based on estimated probabilities of what word might come next in a sentence, it did tend to hallucinate content. For example, it would describe an IOL material that doesn't exist or a type of incision made during cataract surgery that simply is not made. Next steps for this project include testing these questions amongst the 2024 SCORE participants who are going to participate in an in-person wet lab at AAO 2024, and then we'll adjust our questions based on resident feedback. And after this presentation, the question I'd like to leave with all of you is, will generative AI have a significant role in medical education in the future? I would love to hear your thoughts, and these are my acknowledgments. Thank you so much. Any questions? I was curious just if, how you felt in terms of um, the amount of time that was spent um, generating questions this way versus kind of just coming up with questions and explanations. Like it seems like you guys did have to do a fairly significant amount of editing. Right. Errors. Yeah, for sure. And this is something I've also thought about. So I would say in order to produce the questions for a given module, it'd probably be maybe 20 or 30 minutes. Um, but also we're having medical students do it and not attendants who are incredibly busy. So I think that was one of the advantages. Um, but what I would argue about this approach is the fact that coming up with questions from scratch still probably will take more time than having a scaffold that you can extensively edit that's produced by something like ChatGPT. Um, and for some of the modules, um, we actually had the content experts identify how much time they spent editing. And some of them it would be as little as 10 minutes. And some of them it would be as much as maybe 40 minutes to an hour, depending on how many questions we produce. So like some modules had like 30 questions, which we then had to pare down significantly. Um, I also think this approach can be improved as we kind of work on it and see the feedback on the questions um, and maybe train the AI on a little bit more ophthalmology content. Is it, did you, so like, as you keep going, does it, do you feed it the totally edited question and then it like gets better at 
making questions and answer choices as you continue? Or did you not really see that kind of improvement? So I didn't feed in the edited questions because one of the limitations of AI is when you train it on material it's produced, it actually tends to get worse than if you just give it separate sources, which is like new material for the AI. Um, so we didn't actually feed in the edited questions, but I did start refining the instructions when I noticed it making mistakes um, and kind of specified like, you're not following all the characteristics I listed or um, give like more straightforward, shorter answers. Mm -hmm. So it was more kind of providing more prompting rather than really feeding in the edited questions. Okay, um, up next we have Joanna Gorka, who is one of our University of Utah medical students. Um, her fun fact is very pickle themed today. So she is um, a big fan of pickleball and she also likes homemade Polish style pickles. Um, and she's gonna be giving us a talk titled Nevis or Melanoma. Good morning, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to present today. I'm excited to share a case in which we will answer the question, nevus or melanoma? Our patient is a 50 year old woman referred from an outside clinic for a growing choroidal nevus in the right eye. It was first noted about 10 years ago, but it's unclear whether the lesion is following the potential natural progression of the nevus or a quicker growth pattern more suggestive of a melanoma. The patient denies visual symptoms, visual acuity is 20-20, and fields are full. The patient was seen by Dr. Eric Hansen here at the Moran. Exam and imaging revealed an elevated melanocytic lesion with ill-defined borders at 6 o'clock in that right eye. OCT of the lesion showed cystoid changes, some drusen, and RPE alterations. B scan showed a hollow lesion with moderate vascularity, measuring 8.7 by 8.1 by 2.1 millimeters. And lastly, A scan showed low to medium reflectivity of the lesion. We have what can be defined as a high risk choroidal nevus in an asymptomatic 50 year old. It was first noted 10 years ago, though, has some recent documented growth. There are some reassuring chronic features, such as the drusen and RPE atrophy and fibrosis. What is the next step? As we know, biopsies are invasive and not without risk. Yet, if diagnosed, a choroidal melanoma can be deadly with an incidence of metastasis typically cited between 10 to 50%. Broadly, we know that uveal melanomas are exceedingly rare. However, nevi exhibit malignant transformation at rates of 14% at 10 years. What do we know about this patient's risk of malignancy at this point? Validated risk factors can help with this decision-making. Ocular oncologist, Dr. Carol Shields is a pioneer in this area. Malignant risk factors were identified in the 1985 landmark collaborative ocular melanoma study, or COMS. The risk factors found were thickness greater than two millimeters, subretinal fluid, visual symptoms, orange pigment on autofluorescence, and lesion margin within three millimeters of the optic disc. Thus, a mnemonic was coined to find small ocular melanoma, TFSOM. It was updated in 2009 to include using helpful hands daily, representing ultrasound hollowness, absent halo, and absent drusen. Most recently, these risk factors were changed with the current mnemonic to find small ocular melanoma doing imaging. We maintain the hollow lesion risk factor, but added diameter greater than five millimeters. The strongest risk factor for malignant growth at five years with a hazard ratio of 7.76 is thickness greater than two millimeters. And the big three factors are thickness, subretinal fluid, and orange pigment, providing a combined hazard ratio of 67 if all three are present. Our patient did not have the big three, but she did just cross the two millimeter thickness threshold. Many physicians use four risk factors as a threshold to treat immediately. 
With a total of three risk factors, our patient has a five-year transformation risk of 34%. After risks and benefits were discussed, the patient elected to wait and watch. At a two-month follow-up, there was no growth, which was reassuring, although two months is not very long to monitor. At this point, the patient did decide to proceed with the biopsy. Biopsy did reveal a posterior uveal melanoma with gene expression profile of class 1B and PRAME negativity. A GNA11 mutation was identified on next generation sequencing. Decision DXUM is a clinically validated gene expression profile test that evaluates the prognosis of uveal melanomas, and it's most popular here in the US. Class 1B places our patient at an intermediate metastasis risk, or 21% at five years. Reassuringly, PRAME, or preferentially expressed antigen in melanoma, which is associated with increased metastatic risk, was negative in our patient. She underwent staging with CTs of the chest abdomen, pelvis, and chest, which were clear. The melanoma was treated with iodine-125 brachytherapy for 96 hours then followed up with two, every two months to assess for regression. Previously, enucleation was the mainstay treatment for ocular melanomas, but the COM study found that similar survivals occurred uh, with enucleation group patients and brachytherapy patients. So now brachytherapy is the most widely used as it preserves the eye. Once diagnosed, patients should be screened for metastasis with abdominal MRIs every six months for three to five years, yearly until year, and then every six months, and then yearly until year 10. The liver is the most common site of metastasis for uveal melanomas. Yearly chest x-rays can also be performed. Here, we see the regression of our patient's melanoma at two months after treatment. At 1.5 years, the melanoma has regressed further, and the patient has maintained her 2020 vision. So do we have screening for ocular melanoma? Well, the AAO recommends a general eye exam for everyone at age 40. And the median age of diagnosis for ocular melanoma is about, is about 55. So for those getting fundus exams, melanomas can easily be caught and suspicious nevi can be identified for surveillance. However, the 2020 survey showed that only 46% of Americans are getting regular eye exams. In our patient, her nevus was being followed and action was taken at the first signs of transformation, which likely greatly improved her outcomes, despite her tumor showing an intermediate risk genetic profile. Although rates of malignant transformation are relatively low, a BASCM study showed that nevus surveillance is actually cost-effective from a healthcare standpoint. For example, the costs associated with biannual follow-ups and annual OCTs and B scans in a patient with a uh, concerning nevus with risk three risk factors, those costs are reasonable for our healthcare standards. Looking into the horizon for ways to evaluate indeterminate lesions, fluorescence lifetime imaging, or FLEO, could be helpful. Our patient is visualized in the top row with the FLEO image at the right, and then below, we, comparatively, we have a nevus. I think that there's some potential for FLEO to serve as an additional diagnostic tool to guide the decision between biopsy or monitoring for these indeterminate lesions. I'd like to thank some key figures in this patient case, and I will open it up to any questions or comments. I don't have any questions. Okay, uh, we have Riker Ricks next. Um, he is also a University of Utah medical student, um, and he actually loves classic car restoration. So he's restored a 1952 Chevy truck, a 1969 Dodge Charger, and he's actually currently working on a 55 Chevy Nomad. Very cool. Um, and his talk is titled Beyond a Shadow of Doubt. Uh -huh. 
right. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, like she said, my name is Riker Ricks. I'm from the University of Utah, and I'm going to be presenting my presentation today, Beyond a Shadow of Doubt. And as I was preparing this presentation, I actually talked with my daughter, and um, she asked me what I was doing, and I said I was preparing a presentation about shadows, essentially. And so she quickly brought up her favorite episode of Bluey, um, which is titled Shadowlands. And so I just wanted to share her theoretical um, title of my presentation, which would be The Shadowlands of Cataract Surgery. Um, so what about shadows then? So today I'm going to be talking about negative dysphotopsia. Um, this is a possible visual phenomenon that patients can experience after cataract surgery. Um, it is essentially a shadow that they see that resembles a crest or a crescent shape in their temporal visual fields. Um, the incidence of this phenomenon is up to 26% in patients immediately postoperatively, as well as up to 3% of patients up to a year out postoperatively. The etiology of negative dysphotopsia is not completely clear, um, and it's likely multifactorial according to many studies. So studies now show that dysphotopsias are, dysphotopsias are induced by a number of factors. These include anatomic characteristics, IOL properties, and surgical techniques. Um, the illumination gap theory, which is what's shown here, um, is, the, is the most supported explanation for why this happens. To explain the illumination gap theory, what it shows is that there are two different refractions coming in to, to um, hit the retina peripherally. You have lens rays that are being refracted through the IOL, as well as rays that pass just beside the IOL. And this gap that is created called the illumination gap is thought to contribute to that shadow that patients are seeing. Um, so for the case timeline, um, this, this patient was first seen in October of 2021. Um, and I'll just skip to the pertinent parts of her exam, she was found to have two plus shallow anterior chambers bilaterally, as well as two plus NS and one plus cortical cataracts bilaterally. This is just a summary of our clinical timeline to help us as we go through this case. In summary, the patient had anatomic narrow angle and visually significant cataracts OU. Um, for her first cataract surgery on her right eye, the the cataract surgery was mainly uncomplicated. The IOL was inserted into the bag, and the IOL used was a Bosch and Lom and Vista MX60E. Now, the, the characteristics of this lens are shown here. Excuse me. Um, it is a one-piece hydrophobic acrylic lens with a react, refractive index of 1.53 and a sharp square posterior edge around the IOL. After the surgery, this patient immediately started having symptoms of negative dysphotopsia. Um, so again, our timeline, the patient has now had cataract surgery in the right eye and cataract surgery for the left eye has now been scheduled. So for the cataract surgery in left eye, the IOL again was inserted into the bag and reverse optic capture was attempted, but unsuccessful. So the IOL was ultimately left in the bag. The IOL that was chosen for the case in the left eye was a Johnson & Johnson AMO 79002. Now this lens is a three-piece design, a silicone lens um, with a bit of an aberration component of negative 0.27 and a refractive index of 1.47. So um, being a silicone lens and a slightly lower refractive index hopefully would result in um, a less likelihood of having negative dysphotopsia. Unfortunately for this patient, they did have negative dysphotopsia symptoms um, immediately postoperatively as well in the left eye. Um, and then at the one month follow-up for the left eye, the patient was still having strong negative dysphotopsia symptoms. The left eye was worse than the right eye. However, the visual fields that were done at that time were relatively normal. And this can happen in negative dysphotopsia. And the base eye exam was quite well, right eye visual acuity 2015 and left 2020. And the slit lamp showed very well centered uh, posterior capsule IOLs OU. Um, 
so given the persistent negative dysautopsy symptoms, it was considered that either an uh, IOL repositioning or an IOL exchange with a Bosch and LOM LI61AO would be offered to this patient to hopefully correct the negative dysphotopsia. Again, this is just helping us keep track of our timeline. So ultimately, it was decided that IOL repositioning would be the best course of action for this patient. However, the ha our hand was forced in this decision because the LI61AO lens was actually not available at the time of surgery. Um, during surgery, the IOL was appropriately dialed into the sulcus, and this happened successfully. This diagram shows here uh, an example of a IOL that is in the capsular bag. After being dialed into the sulcus, you see the haptics are sitting in the ciliary sulcus with the IOL oriented anterior to the capsular rexus. Um, Postoperatively, the patient, um, the, the IOL appeared to be centered very well. However, the patient unfortunately continued to have negative dysphotopsia despite moving that lens to the sulcus. Um, so again, just helping us keep track of our timeline. So um, I, I guess at this point, you're thinking, well, what do we do now? Um, we've, we've, we put in a lens that has properties that we would have hoped would have prevented negative dysphotopsia and then also moved the lens to the sulcus. However, the negative dysphotopsia has not resolved at any degree. And so at this point, experts in the field were consulted. This includes uh, Nicole Fram and Ike Ahmed. The patient actually met in clinic with Dr. Ahmed who suggested that either um, in, in the left eye that we try an iris suture fixation with the existing lens or to try an IOL exchange with this LI61AO lens, which is also a three-piece silicone lens. Um, so again, just helping us keep track of this timeline. Um, so fast forward, um, those the the options that I just shared with you were the original options, but there's also another option, and that is to simply wait and see if the patient can neuro adapt to these symptoms that she's having. And that is what happened for a while. The patient did seem to adapt to a degree. However, by July of 2024, the patient began having worsening of her negative dysphotopsia symptoms, especially in that left eye, and it was completely debilitating to her life. And so she opted to have an IOL exchange rather than an iris uh, suture fixation. Um, let's see if this will play. So this just shows a couple components of that surgery. You can see the primary lens um, being dissected there, and each hemisection is being removed with a micrograsper, the new IOL being the LI61AO lens has now been inserted and was appropriately centered in the eye and with, with good centration postoperatively. I should know it wasn't showed in the video, but the lens was originally delivered into the bag and the hope was that we could do reverse optic capture. However, it was really difficult with the silicone lens. And so ultimately the lens was left in the sulcus similar to the previous lens that was removed. So this was the lens that I've been talking about. Again, it's a three-piece silicone um, design, and it has a refractive index of 1.43. And if you remember, the previous lens was 1.47, so slightly lower refractive index. And it's, it's aberration-free, whereas the other lens did have a component of aberration, and it has a square edge as well around the periphery. Um, so... Now that it's August 2024, the patient has had her IOL exchange, and now what happened? Well, the negative dyslotopsia symptoms resolved. Um, so finally, after all this time, this patient's been experiencing these shadows for almost three years, and finally, um, one of the, the methods that we used actually worked for her, which is wonderful, and, and she was very happy to have that. Um, so th my summary of, of this case is that, you know, negative dysphotopsia, it's a relatively common complication that happens in cataract surgery um, that's experienced by patients. And it, it, in this case, interestingly, the patient's negative dysphotopsia did not improve 
with moving the primary lens to the sulcus. Um, so in this case as well, an IOL exchange with a lens of a lower refractive index, as well as different spherical aber aberration numbers did correct the negative dysphotopsia. Um, and then in addition to a number of other methods, which I didn't go into detail about in this um, presentation, surgeons should definitely consider IOL composition for, correct, for correcting negative dysphotopsia. So these are some of my sources and thank you so much. Hello. Can you hear me? If there's any questions. Yes, Dr. Olson. Sorry, we had earlier morning meetings went a little long. I wish I could have heard your entire talk. So this is an interesting phenomenon, and there's still a lot we don't understand about it. Yeah. I think one important thing for people to realize is that this is very much having to do with uh, um, our, our you know, brain input on deciding what it wants to see and not see. You, you can show through ray tracing that everybody has this shadow. And if you ask early on, uh, you'll get as many as a third of people say, yeah, there is a small shadow, but the brain can ignore it. So for some people, not only can they not ignore it, it becomes an overwhelming symptom. Mm -hmm. So one thing that uh, we, we often think of this as a totally physical, and yes, there, it is a physical thing that's there, is that I had a fair amount of success with just telling people that uh, there's been work that's done that, for instance, if you concentrate on the feeding of the pants on your knee and just think about nothing but that uh, aggressively, it's so uncomfortable that you can't wear pants for mm -hmm. So we keep forgetting about the fact that uh, you know our brain's an analog computer and it's a variable gain, and depending upon how we respond, we can change that gain. And tell people, I want you just not even to think about it. I want you not to worry about it. I want you to use this amount. Of Dr. Olson said this is going to get better and this get better. I'm amazed how many people at three to four months called up and said it's just gone. Yeah. So uh, don't don't immediately jump to surgery. Try to let people understand, you know, what's going on. And there's somewhere you have to, but I'm I'm seeing a lot of people who are about ready to have pretty significant surgery and uh, and but I've also seen people that have been everything we know that may work and it's still persisting mm -hmm. so uh, I've seen both of those variations but uh, just remember that that there are many times that if people will just quit worrying about it because when they worry about it separate they, they're turning the gain up they're telling the brain this is bad I got to concentrate <laughs> on this so uh, do also try to do see if we can push more non-surgical options. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, first line treatment for this is reassurance. And that's and that's definitely- Reassurance. You yeah, <laughs> what you don't tell a patient is there's nothing wrong. I can't tell how often. They're just so tell me says your surgery's perfect. There's nothing wrong. So no, it's there. It's a measurable shadow that due to the lens designs that we have today and that everybody probably could see it, most people eventually, but it's not much of a message for most and it will disappear. And so just work with me, get, work on it, give some time. And, and at least half the time I've found people just who were ready for surgery, seen it disappear. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Olson. Uh, can you hear me? Hello? I think you're good to go. Can you hear me? Hello, hello, hello. No. All right, forget it. You can hear me? Uh oh. Okay. I think everyone on the chat can, I mean, on video can hear me. Can you guys hear me down in the auditorium? Try again. Can you, can you try again, Dr.
Hello, hello. All right, too late. Hello. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, they could hear me remote, but not there. Oh, well, we're kind of out of time, but um, just real briefly, I think Riker did an amazing job. This was a very difficult case. I could spend a whole another hour discussing sort of my decision-making along the process, which was kind of difficult. And I don't think the timeline really depicted that exactly. But anyway, I just want to add a few more points. Dr. Olson's completely right. Um, in studies, it's interesting that you know that it's also a brain phenomenon because it's more common than negative dyslexias in uh, women and left, uh, left eyes. But I just want to bring up one other thing is um, the different treatments for it besides moving the lens anterior the capsule. You can also open up the uh, nasal capsule. And many of you know about the study that I'm trying to do now about anterior capsule polishing. I wanted to see if there was relation for anterior capsule polishing and whether or not it reduced incidence of negative dysphotopsia or increase. And interestingly, at the moment, we seem to be finding that nasal polishing is causing more incidence of negative dysphotopsia, which if you think about it, it's actually counterintuitive. You would think it'd be the opposite. Uh, so very interesting. Uh, good job, Riker. Not to discuss there, but uh, good job. Thank you. Did you just say four? Yes. yes. Polishing? Um, as I'm pulling up the next presentation, I was just going to give a quick reminder to anyone who came in um, a little later. So the number for CME credit is actually 241052. All right. Okay, so as this is getting pulled up here, um, our next a uh, medical student who's going to be giving a presentation is Ty Whitaker. Um, he's also from the University of Utah, and he is also a pickleball enthusiast. Um, he even got a whopping $300 for winning a pickleball tournament recently. Um, and Ty is going to be giving us a talk titled Clinical Pearls about Post-Occlusion Surge Learned from the Surge Chamber. What you didn't mention is that I typically play at a Fairmont Park with a bunch of 60-year-olds. So if you ever want to come play with Francis and Gladys with me, just, just let me know. We'll talk after this. All right, um, let's get going. So uh, my name is Ty Whitaker. I'm a fourth year here at the University of Utah. It's an honor to be talking with you all today. Um, I have to say there's nothing I love more than speaking to a room full of people that know more about the subject I'm presenting on than I do. So thank you for that adrenaline rush this morning. I while we were waiting for Dr. Nakasuka's comment, I uh, clocked my heart rate. I was uh, coming in at 123, so that's, uh, that's, that's always fun. All right, um, so the title of my presentation is uh, Clinical Pearls Learned from the Surge Chamber. Um, I have no financial disclosures, neither do any of the medical students I worked with, and Dr. Petty and Dr. Olson's are as listed. So first off, what is post-occlusion surge? Uh, Post-occlusion surge is a phenomenon um, that can occur after vacuum pressure builds enough to clear a lens fragment from the tip during phaco emulsification. The built vacuum pressure exerts a compressive force on the outflow tubing, which, um, which can then snap back to its original form when the occlusion at the tip is broken. This causes a negative pressure surge within the anterior chamber as fluid is drawn into the outflow tubing as it snaps back to its original shape. This is relevant because the negative pressure surge can draw the posterior capsule forward to contact the tip and can potentially cause a posterior capsular rupture. Um, so the creation of the surge chamber, we uh, lovingly named it the Chamber of Secrets as we were developing it. Here's a picture of uh, me, another medical student, Tanner. Riker was also um, present with us helping develop this. He wasn't present for the picture. And then over here on the, the left of the screen, we have Koya, who's an engineer at the Center for Medical Innovation who helped uh, make you know, our ideas a reality. Um, here on the left-hand side of the screen, you see the original uh, blueprint I drew out. Um, when I went to go meet with the engineers for the first time. Luckily, they were able to interpret my hieroglyphics and we were able to create uh, this surge chamber um, that was able to um, measure um, post-occlusion surge um, using a variety of hand pieces. So here um, is the, the surge chamber. I have an explanation of kind of how it works, but I figured it'd be a little bit more useful to narrate a, a trial here um, if this video wants to work for me. Before I start the video, um, what you can see is that there's a port, a watertight port at the top, which we're able to insert the handpiece through. Um, the 
the chamber itself is filled with um, BSS and we're able to, um, there's a, there's that piece in the middle, which can act as a, as a object on which to create occlusion. So when we start the trial here, let's see if this works. Okay. Go. All right. We'll give it seven seconds to allow the pressure, uh, the chamber to pressurize to the set IOP seven, that we have here. Eight, seven, At seven eight. seconds, um, we'll occlude the tip. Um, you can hear that the vacuum pressure has built um, to the, the maximum set break vacuum. Occlusion. And we break occlusion and then we allow the, um, the pressure sensor to monitor the changes that happen thereafter. So our first experiment, we tested the active sentry handpiece against the Ozil handpiece. Both of these handpieces um, are used with the Centurion um, vision system. Um, the difference being between the active sentry and the Ozil handpiece are that the active sentry handpiece has the pressure sensor in the handpiece itself, as opposed to being in the console. Um, with, with the pressure sensor being a little bit closer to the action, um, theoretically it would make it able to react to post-occlusion surge quicker and reduce its magnitude. Um, as a primer to what our data will look like, I have a sample of one of our trials here. Um, you can see between point A and B, that's the seven seconds we allowed for pressurization of the chamber. At point B, that's where we created occlusion. You can see there's a slight pressure bump typically, um, which is then um, evened out um, by the you know, pressure sensing technology. And then at point C, that's where we broke occlusion. And you can see the, the negative pressure surge that ensues. We defined the, the pressure surge as you know, the beginning, where the first time we saw the negative inflection of the slope of the line. Um, and then at point D, um, when, once we saw that the machine was able to sense that there was a, a pressure drop and respond. Yeah, so coming back, um, here, let me, I guess we'll, let's see if this uh, video wants to play again. Set go. So you can, I would just look at a seven at a seven seconds here. If you let's see, like uh, laser six, pointer to work. Seven. Um, one. Laser pointer here. So here's the occlusion um, piece, and you can see right here with the beveled tip of the that the active sentry and ozil hand piece is used. We're able to just use a swinging motion without in, introducing um, excessive pressure into the system, um, and able to just kind of uh, toggle on and off between um, occlusion. So here's our results from this first experiment. We have um, our data here. We found that the active sentry technology was able to significantly reduce both the magnitude and duration of post-occlusion surge. Uh, we have our data here in the, in the table as well as the graphs. And you can see the active sentries um, in red and the ozil in blue that um, really what we're looking at is kind of this line segment here um, is a lot smaller for the active sentry than it is um, for the ozil. Um, so the takeaway here is that in patients at increased risk of posterior capsular tear, if the option to use the active sentry handpiece exists, um, it would help minimize the risk of, uh, of tear. Um, next. So, so part of the action is, is it, I mean, if you had a surge, it was huge, but it was over many, many, many seconds, easy to react to that. So the shorter the time is also a bit of a problem. So you, if, like in all physics, you, you know, you can't give, get one thing and get everything else free. It's less, but the time is shorter. So it, it would appear to be going on a little, a little faster. And whether that's a safety issue or not, hard to say, because we're only talking about 15 hundredths of a, yeah. 15 hundredths of a second, but that's the kinds of things that you got to think about where you may have a plus on one side, but there may be a negative. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Um, our next experiment we looked at was the active center handpiece at increasingly low um, IOPs. So we know that surge is maximized by operating at a low IOP with a high vacuum pressure. Um, this being the case, we wanted to explore the effect of using a lower set IOP on post occlusion surge. Um, this is clinically relevant because operating a lower IOP um, is, is softer in the corneal endothelium. Here's the um, settings that we used um, for this next experiment. Um, and here are results. We found that there is no statistically significant difference between the magnitude duration of surge at, IOP, um, at an IOP 50 um, versus an IOP of 70, but there was a statistically significant difference between the magnitude and duration of surge at IOP 30 versus an IOP 50 or 70. Um, so the takeaway here is that the technology is good. Um, while the technology is good, the surge at IOP 30 is still significantly um, larger than at 50 or 70. So it's important to balance the risk of posterior capsular tear secondary to surge with that of uh, corneal damage caused by operating at an elevated IOP. Um, our next experiment, we looked at a uh, Venturi versus... 
I'll be see it that way. Reduce or eliminate that that difference in search. Yeah, um, we're we're still working on a continuing trials here. Um, the medical students that we're working with. Our Bill is a big time cataract surgeon. There's yeah. a line of things coming. No. Just, so stay tuned, buddy. Stay tuned. <laughs> no, this, this this is great because we we have a whole line of uh, of experiments we want to do with this surge chamber. So I really appreciate the feedback. I'd love any feedback at the end of this uh, presentation to continue um, to have ideas to look into. So um, yes. Going, going on to the Venturi versus peristaltic pumps, um, the Johnson & Johnson uh, Veritas platform offers the ability to toggle between peristaltic and Venturi pump, pump modes to generate vacuum. Given vacuum's importance and post-occlusion surge, we wanted to evaluate if there's a difference in the magnitude or duration of surge produced in each of these settings. Um, these are the, the settings we used. Of note, um, we, since completing this experiment, um, have learned the importance of the ramp factor in the Veritas system. This was all done at ramp, a uh, ramp of one. Um, further experiments are going to evaluate um, at, at different ramp, ramp levels to evaluate for the, um, the surge within Venturi, between Venturi and peristaltic modes. Here are the differences. Uh, here's the results that we found. A significant difference was observed in the magnitude of post-occlusion surge between the Venturi and peristal peristaltic pumps at both a bottle height of 41 centimeters and 81 centimeters. Our takeaway here is that there may be a lower risk of posterior capsular tear when using uh, machines that employ the Venturi system to generate vacuum. Again, with that caveat that we do still need to look at um, other ramp levels to see how that might change. Just, just point out that very counterintuitive and totally against the uh, overall experience with Irby Venturi and it shows how the engineers have been able to dramatically modulate that. J just to put it in perspective, the first phaco emulsification machine that, that I used almost 50 years ago, hard to imagine <laughs> that, that uh, at, at, at having a vacuum of uh, 30 millimeters of mercury, you would lose half the chamber. And at 50, you would lose all the chamber. So you could imagine what it's like dealing, having to do your aspiration. Yeah. You know, at 30, 35 was being aggressive. That's how things have changed due to the engineering that's occurred over the years. Yeah, that's fantastic. And that's why we're doing this research to kind of continue continue um, the engineering and what we know about FACO dynamics. Um, all right. Um, I'll kind of be quick on this one. Uh, Centurion versus Veritas versus the Quatera platforms. We just kind of wanted to test them head to head. Um, at kind of some standard settings and kind of see how they did. Here's the parameters that we used, um, and here are the results we found. There was a significant difference um, in post-occlusion surge magnitude noted between all three machines and the um, surge duration seen in the Johnson & Johnson Veritas machine. So our takeaway here is that it's important to be mindful um, how each platform differs in its ability to mitigate surge. I know we have a lot of experienced surgeons in this room, and it's just an um, I'd love to hear after afterwards um, kind of how you approach um, the, uh, the potential of surge when you're um, evaluating a patient and um, choosing which uh, platform to use if you if you do have the choice. I know sometimes it's just in the operating room and that's what you use, but um, I'd love to hear that afterwards. And then lastly, um, our most recent experiment has been with the Zeiss MyCore cataract extraction device. And answering the question, does it produce post-occlusion surge? So for those not familiar with the Zeiss MyCore, um, it's a device capable of removing a cataract without using phaco emulsification. Um, the picture here is really the entire device. The only thing else you need besides this is um, an IV pole and a bag of BSS. Um, it's all, all within the handpiece, and really how you operate it is just depressing that trigger that you see. Um, because there's no outflow tubing connecting the handpiece to where vacuum is being generated, there therefore, um, therefore theoretically no post-occlusion surge should be produced based on our current understandings of surge. So. Here's our, a, a sample graph from one of our initial trials with the MyCore. Um, we set the bottle height to equivalent IOP of 60 millimeters of mercury, and these were the results. To kind of just walk you through what we're seeing here, um, this is where we started the trial. As soon as I fully depressed the trigger, it took about I mean, a little bit less than five seconds to drop to just above 30 millimeters of mercury. As soon as we created occlusion, the pressure was able to kind of come back, not all the way to 60, but close. And then as soon as uh, we broke occlusion, it dropped again. And then as, this is where we let off the trigger and things just kind of stabilized again. So this left us with the question, what happens if, with the MyCore pressure tracing if we never create an occlusion? Um, these were the results of the trials we did to test this question. 
Um, with the MICOR here, we saw at IOP 60 and IOP 90 that as soon as I depressed the trigger to um, all the completely, that we would take about you know between five and seven seconds to drop to about 30 millimeter um, 30 millimeters of mercury less than the set IOP. That happened at 60 and 90. You see that we dropped to 30, and then at 90 we dropped to 60, and then as soon as we let off the trigger, it comes back up. Um, so these are some interesting findings. Um, these experiments proved that there was no post-occlusion surge as defined by our criteria, um, but they also highlight that there is a mismatch between inflow and outflow in the MICOR device that causes significant drop in IOP if the trigger remains depressed um, while the tip remains unoccluded. Again, I would love to hear afterwards um, how clinically significant um, any, any of you in the audience feel this is, um, as we are still in the process of uh, drafting this paper. Um, thank you for listening, and I'd love to try to answer any questions you have for me. These are my references. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Olson. Uh, just kudos. I, I want to congratulate all of you who've been involved in this project. We, we fiddled with this. I mean, we used to take human eyes, try to use ultrasound to get some of this information. But to have a really good, solid way of checking it. Every company has their talking heads, their consultants saying they're the best, or they have almost no occlusion surge. I mean, this kind of looking to see where we are uh, versus the different uh, machines, the different technology is really important because that's still probably the single most biggest risk for breaking the capsule is that post-acute concern. <clears throat> less and less of a problem, but very real. And so continue the work. The one thing about this, because what you're doing is a physics experiment, is there's, there's always an explanation. You know, often in, in biological stuff, well, it's an enzyme X, Y, or Z. There, there's something. And, and I'm, for instance, on the my, my core and the, on, or the my loop, I'm almost my core. I'm almost sure that they haven't figured out exactly how they can get enough infusion to overcome their aspiration. And I, I it could be some strictures they have there, but it, it's clearly something, and that's a that's a big enough difference that certainly could be a concern. Yeah, thank you. Awesome job, and I hope your heart rate has normalized now. <laughs> okay, our final presentation, uh, we have Azra Aisha, who's also from University of Utah. Um, her fun fact made me laugh. So she's a huge fan of llamas. Um, she visited a llama farm for every birthday from the ages of 10 to 16. And she has a still active email address called llamalover at gmail.com. <laughs> and uh, she's going to be giving us a presentation titled, While You Were Sleeping, IOP Fluctuations in a Glaucoma Patient with Obstructive Sleep Apnea. Hi. Morning, everyone. Um, so wanted to start talking about a interesting patient case of someone with both glaucoma and sleep apnea. Um, this is a 60 year old female who's been a longtime patient of Dr. Chortkoff's um, and more recently, Dr. Nakatsuka. Um, she has a history of sleep apnea, hypertension, and hypercholesterolemia. And she was diagnosed with sleep apnea in the severity or severe form over a decade ago. And she's been compliant with CPAP for that entire time. Um, and her other medical conditions. Sorry. There we go. Let me try the clicker. There we go. So she does have obesity and her other uh, conditions have been managed with these medications. Um, so she has quite a dense history for her glaucoma. Um, so just to lay things out, she got her diagnosis of sleep apnea in 2012, and then she became a glaucoma suspect in 2015 um, in Dr. Chortkoff's clinic when she had not only a family history of glaucoma, but also a optic nerve asymmetry found in clinic and borderline IOPs of 20 and 19 in the right and left eyes. Two and a half years later, she had cataract surgery, and at her one-month post-op visit, she had an IOP spike of 40 in both eyes, and she was immediately started on a few medications, including latanoprost, timolol, bromonidine, and brinzolamide, the last three being three times a day. Um, once her pressures uh, stabilized postoperatively, she was maintained on latanoprost once daily and timolol twice, and the target 
pressure that we were aiming for was 15 millimeters of mercury. So for a couple of years, Dr. Chorkoff attempted a variety of IOP lowering drops, um, but the range in clinic uh, for her IOP was always just short of that, ranging from 17 to 20. Um, this was her visual field at the time. So as you can see, um, her she had superior and inferior scattered losses on her right eye, and then a left uh, paracentral scotoma, her left eye. And then her RNFL um, did show progressive thinning of her um, or of her left eye. So sorry, the numbers are all tiny, but you can see from 2015 to 2020, um, the central RNFL thickness went from 80 to 73 microns. Um, and the left eye was worse than the right eye. So continuing on, because we still weren't meeting that target pressure of 15 millimeters of mercury, um, patient went on to have SLT done in her left eye. Um, IOP at that point was 19 and 19, so it didn't seem to take effect. Um, then the following year in March, um, Dr. Nakatsuka did a goniotomy on the left eye of the patient. Um, pressures were still 18 and 17, kind of frustrating. And then September 2023, um, the patient did have a trap done on her left eye with her IOP is reaching 17. And then in November of last year, the right eye trap did finally help reach the target of less than 15 with an IOP of 11 and 14 millimeters mercury. So that temporarily helped meet the target. But fast forward about four months, um, this patient had her IOP measurements slightly creeping back up to about 18. And so at this point, both her pulmonologist managing her sleep apnea and um, her ophthalmologist were concerned for what could be causing this persistently elevated IOP despite significant medical and surgical interventions. And her pulmonologist expressed possible concern for CPAP affecting this. Um, so he wanted to consider alternatives to CPAP therapy, um, particularly the hypoglossal nerve stimulation. So she had a sleep study done, which is where I met this patient. And she had a spike in her pressure at night um, of 28 and 31 in the right and left eyes at um, the early hours of 3 a.m. And so this was pretty pretty surprising because her clinic visit from just a few few weeks before, her pressures were measuring 15 and 18. So still slightly above target, but not this far above. And so, um, so Dr. Nakatsuka sent her home with the eye care home, and she captured her diurnal patterns of IOP for 10 days. So we have here with eye care, she the 10 day pattern reflected that of what we found in the sleep study. Her highest eye pressure of her right eye was 28, and her left eye was 32. And really importantly, I wanna point out is that the, the variability of both eyes had a uh, difference of 12 units. Um, so ranging from 28 to 16 or 32 to 18 or actually 14 units in the left eye. Um, so pretty alarming, especially given the fact that she had steady pressures in clinic. So the patient required a bleb revision of her left eye um, of March of this year, which improved her eye pressure. And then we wanted to see how her pressures changed um, using eye care for five days at home. And oh, let me show that one. So for five days after, you can see a significant improvement of not only her max IOP, um, but also that fluctuation. She only had a difference of about five units of five units for both eyes, which is much better than the 12 we were seeing before that bleb revision. Um, most recently, Dr. Chorkoff saw her in clinic last month and her IOP was 13 and seven. Um, and she's only requiring latanoprost drops once nightly in her right eye. So she's doing much better. Um, some key points, um, big takeaways from this case is that that it was the home tonometry that captured that captured that otherwise elusive IOP spike. Um, and it points out a clinical need for more access or more technology to allow for that continuous 24 hour monitoring of, um, of eye pressures, particularly uh, contact lenses like triggerfish are becoming more and more popular for that reason. And another point is that research has shown that patients with glaucoma, or sorry, patients with sleep apnea are prone to develop glaucoma, perhaps because of the vascular dysregulation or maybe the inflammatory damages caused from the hypoxia. There's still a lot of unanswered questions there. Um, 
But because of that, we're interested in knowing the short and long-term effects of CPAP on IOP. Uh, most recently, there was a systematic review um, published uh, just a few months ago, which was in conclusion, inconclusive. Um, it was um, in patients, these were 191 patients with sleep apnea, and they did find that one month and one year of CPAP did have a statistically significant increase in IOP. But otherwise, um, this, since it was a review, there weren't standardized protocols to account for um, patient severity of sleep apnea, what kind of machine they're using, and then positioning of the patient. And so it looks like um, larger scale randomized control trials would be helpful. And also none of these patients had glaucoma. And so it's hard to um, draw that into our question here. Another important detail was, um, and this I discussed mostly with Dr. Wirosko, my mentor, who mentioned that we might need to reprioritize which clinical data we value in clinic. So currently we give a lot of emphasis to um, the IOP measurements that are found in clinic, but maybe a range could be more indicative of the disease progression. And so this was a great article published a few months ago by Dr. Arthur Sitt, um, which found that which could possibly explain why our patient, despite steady IOP measurements in clinic, was facing progressive retinal nerve fiber layer thinning and visual field defects that were not responding to treatment. Um, something important from that paper was that it was found that patients with a low average IOP but greater high greater IOP fluctuations were actually at a greater risk of visual field progression than those with a low IOP and then high, uh, low IOP fluctuation and high mean. Um, another important study that was cited in that was the collaborative initial glaucoma treatment study, which compiled nine years of data and found that uh, fluctuation of IOP by more than eight and a half was associated with visual field loss and progression, regardless of what the patient's baseline IOP was. Um, so for next steps, um, we are working with the uh, sleep wake center here at the U. And um, we want to know, you know, what's what's going on? Is it the nighttime? Is it CPAP? Is it OSA? Or is it glaucoma that's causing this IOP increase? And are these effects transient? Or are they permanent? Like, what are the long term effects of this? And then lastly, we want to know, um, why would or what does such an I such an fluctuation of IOP mean in terms of glaucoma damage? progression, and prognosis, especially from the biomechanical perspective. And that is it. Thank you all so much. Any questions? Yeah, I was just going to say a couple of things. That um, article on repetitive tissue, tissue strain is really interesting because similar studies in diabetes patients have shown that um, fluctuations in IOP, even if they're achieving, or I'm sorry, fluctuations in blood sugar, even if they're achieving lower blood sugar levels, um, can be potentially more damaging to end organs than just having like a steady but slightly higher blood sugar level. And it seems like some studies are showing similar things with IOP and glaucoma. And I also thought it was really interesting that those massive like 14 <laughs> difference in fluctuation in that patient was post trab. Yeah. It's usually traps do a really good job of like blunting that fluctuation. So it'd be interesting to see what her spikes were like before the trap as well. Yeah. I wish we had that data. That would have been really interesting, but I agree. Thank you, Ashley, our future glaucoma specialist. <laughs> Any other questions? Just prove that you don't know unless you measure it. True. Well, over and over again, and we found that unless you you can theorize, but sometimes you just got to measure and see what happens. I'm wondering as well, because you think of a trap. I mean, you're right that that part of the overall process of that is that it, there's all kinds of other ways that that changes could the trap should be able to take up that difference, right? Is I'm wondering uh, if if someone particularly who, who is in this case morbidly obese. If it's rolling over on that eye or, or their position, I know a, a lot of people uh, with sleep apnea, particularly if they're morbidly obese, want to lie more on their face or face side. And maybe, maybe there's a point pressure that's happening under those circumstances. Maybe you're pushing and collapsing the bleb at the same time. 
you're putting pressure on the eye. Those are, I think, so if there's anything we could do where at the same time, maybe maybe at the sleep center, they could be filming to see what the position is when they measure and see those spikes, that could be also interesting. I think, also, uh, I think also Dr. Knocker and Dr. Knocker students know so you might want to comment, but I think that that trap in the left eye was poorly, kind of poorly functioning. Uh, um, it was already kind of difficult. I think you uh, needled it a couple of times. So I think it was and it, yeah, and it already had a small osteum. And so perhaps it was just needed to be revised as well. Very good. Yeah, the other with the sleep apnea issue, realize when you do things in the sleep center, they have people sleep there, sort of. They wake them up every five to 10 minutes all night long. So any data you get there is artificial in terms of being in any sense representative of what happens with those patients at home at night. So think about doing it at home. I mean, the sleep center is, is a euphemism. You do not get any sleep. <laughs> the evil voice comes on and says, Hold on to your left side, do this. And, and also think about what kind of mask or the nasal pillow thing they're using because some of those things may push it on. Do. I mean, for the same reason, I know our, our oculoplastics colleagues, you know, when they see people with floppy eyelids center, the first question is, have you been to the sleep center and are you on CPAP? Because if not, you need to be because 100% of those patients have sleep bad. And that's, that's that's the issue there, at least in my conversations with them. So just think about, and, and maybe might be worth thinking about this at home. Yeah, definitely. When they actually sleep. Yeah, you know, like the 24 hour contact lenses are becoming more um, mm -hmm. helpful, like uh, trigger fish, I believe is one of them. <laughs> yes, um, so I think that could, that could be more helpful because there are a lot of variables we couldn't control for in the sleep center, which is a shame. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.